Thank you for this lovely introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to meet each and every one of you here today to share what we are doing at the University of Guelph and also get some feedback and comments and suggestions by the end of our talk. Good things come in small packages. So we are in 2016. By 2050, the world population is going to be about 9 billion. So as of now, it's about 7 billion. There is a need to feed 2 billion people in about 20, 30 years. At the same time, the cultivable land or the arable land is shrinking. We also have to take into account the calorie count in terms of balanced diet and balanced nutrition for each and every citizen of this particular globe. So there are market agencies, also World Health Organization and Food and Agricultural Organization have done an estimate and analysis and they have found out that in 2012, the global population needs about 20 gigacalories of food. By 2050, we need about 40 gigacalories, which means we need to double the amount of uh, calories that need to be fed to the world population. At the same time, in terms of vegetarian as well as the food animals, when we look at the distribution between beef, mutton, pork, poultry, and uh, other egg-related uh, sector, we could see that 82 million is about uh, the production of the number of poultry-based animals is about 82 million in 2005, but it is going to shoot. It has to meet at least 181 million tons of meat from the poultry sector, like layers, turkeys, and other related birds by uh, 2050. So it is an opportunity and also a challenge to be able to meet this particular statistics, particular uh, growth. So to be able to increase the food by 70 percentage and meat production to increase by 50 percentage, livestock sector has to overcome a variety of challenges. Recently, World Health Organization has released the statistics uh, based on their data, they found out that every year there is a three new diseases occurs. So out of those three new diseases, two diseases come from the livestock sector. Livestock includes dairy, poultry, pork or swine and other related sector. And of these, 75 percentage of the disease has a potential for being zoonotic, which means they can possibly cause disease to the human. Right now, you might have heard the virus, Zika virus, in the news. Uh, just two weeks ago, we had about, uh, from um, Indiana province, state of United States, there was H7N8, uh, avian flu virus strain uh, outbreak has happened. So that's a brand new strain that has never uh, uh, happened here in North America. So that's a type of example of the possibility of disease outbreak in North America. So to be able to meet the challenge and also overcome the possibility of controlling the disease diagnostics, there is a need for shift. The shift is basically, instead of shipping samples from the farm, from the barn, from the diary, basically do the test right then and there uh, at the barn itself, at the poultry itself, at the barn itself. So we, we have agreed, a variety of scientists across the globe has agreed that we have entered the fourth revolution in agriculture. So we have passed three revolutions. The first revolution is basically mechanization due to industrial revolution in uh, United Kingdom and Europe that happened in the 18th century. The second revolution is green revolution, basically doubling the amount of the production of crop uh, using fertilizers and pesticides and a variety of techniques and strategies. So that was between the period 1943 to 1970s. And in the third revolution, it was predominantly in the United States, uh, genetic engineering or uh, genome-based technologies uh, since 1973. So I would say for the past uh, one decade, and we are also foreseeing 
uh, to enter into an era called precision agriculture or PLF, precision livestock farming. So basically, how we can do things precisely to be able to protect this, the public as well as the food animal from the disease, at the same time double the food production uh, by using a variety of tools and technologies. So from a crop side, I would say th there is about 9 percentage loss in whatever we grow here in North America. So we are a well-developed country with such an advanced technologies. So whenever we grow a crop, after a crop has been grown, if we can preserve and store the crop from the loss, making each and every wheat kernel count through an advanced technology, that is the precision agriculture towards uh, uh, crop production. The same concept for PLF, which is precision livestock farming. So with regards to Ontario poultry sector, the world poultry meat production is about 93 million tons per year approximately. So poultry accounts for 41 percentage of meat consumption in North America alone because of the protein and the other benefits associated in consuming the meat and the egg and the associated products. Here in Ontario, the chicken industry contributes approximately $2.72 billion worth to the Canadian provincial economy and also has creates approximately 19,000 jobs through food manufacturing, processing, poultry sector, and so on. So a small epidemic, a small outbreak can cause a huge impact uh, in the economy of the province. So here's just a funny thing, uh, a joke. Hey mom, what's this bird flu? Don't all birds flu? Then the little chicks, they say, let's eat. So the mom is thinking they have to learn a lot. The other joke you can see, the first time one of them sneezes, cut the rope. Uh, the message here is basically, if there is an outbreak in a farm, um, that farm a poultry farm that has to be immediately quarantined before a single incident that can potentially spread. For example, uh, about 45 um, uh, million worth of birds were euthanized in the uh, United States just a year ago. So that's a huge uh, volume of bird and also it created a significant impact in the poultry sector and the economy. So the goal, what is the missing link here? Why the diseases occurs, but how do we go about preventing the disease? The overall approach of our bio nano lab at the University of Guelph and also a variety of industrial sector is enabling the producers to move from reactive. After the disease occurs, they try to prevent it. So to move from preventive to proactive approach through a predictive technology, which means even before the disease occurs, using pre precision livestock farming, sensing technologies and nanotechnologies, we can predict uh, because of the correlation of a variety of factors, there is a possibility of disease to occur. So we can definitely go ahead and prevent the disease occurrence. So enabling the producers from reactive to predictive through proactive technology-based approach is the goal. So avian influenza statistics, about 48 million turkeys and layers were affected from high pathogenic avian influenza and they were euthanized uh, last year. Uh, since 2003, about uh, the past 12 years, billions of dollars were lost in the world economy just because of one particular disease that affected the poultry sector. Preventing the spread of avian influenza is the best way to keep the disease under control. So in this case, prevention starts with early diagnosis. We want to find out even before the disease occurs and monitor the health of the birds. So when a disease occurs, a avian influenza, what are the possible symptoms um, or the clinical signs of that the bird go through? So we get flu, uh, we, we have running nose, we sometimes our temperature goes higher. Similarly, birds have a variety of flu-like symptoms. 
uh, there are two strains, uh, high pathogen versus low pathogen. Low pathogen all the time occurs, it comes and goes. Farmers can easily uh, find out the possible symptoms. But the focus here is on high pathogenic strain because high pathogenic strain creates a clear symptoms such as ruffled feathers, soft shelled eggs, depression, the motility or the movement of the bird inside the barn is restricted. So the birds kind of uh, 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 shy from making plenty of movement. So that is a symptom. And also droopiness, loss of appetite. They don't take the volume of feed they are supposed to take and the water consumption also drastically reduces over a period of time. And also, obviously, the sudden drop in egg production because of the change in the metabolism uh, inside the system of the chicken bird. So, again, the possibility of zoonotic or the disease transmission from a high pathogenic strain of a chicken bird to human being is very, very low in North America. But in other countries, it has happened. So that's why the focus is to prevent and identify and uh, uh, even before it occurs, there is a need to pro protect the birds. But low pathogenic, it is easy to manage. The management strategies include basically changing the feeding strategy, adding supplements, and also enhancing the hygiene uh, of the uh, poultry barn, clean, clean, and clean. So right now, when a disease occurs, veterinarians, food safety inspectors, they walk inside the poultry barn, and then they take a uh, sampling. So samples could be from the environmental area. They can take samples uh, from the swab or the oral fluid, or sometimes they also uh, take blood samples from the bird. So imagine if the farm is so far from the animal health testing laboratory because after they take the sample, derive the sample, the sample has to be shipped to the animal laboratory to be able to test it. So in the lab, commonly used technique is RT-PCR. It's a real-time um, PCR technique, so which takes about minimum six to eight hours to identify whether it is a low pathogen or a high pathogen. But to be able to precisely find out what strain is causing in terms of H5N1 versus H7N9, the differentiation between the H versus N, it sometimes takes about three to five days. So that's a lot of time to be able to understand the result. So the challenge here is bringing down the time to results. If we can bring down the time to results and enable the farmers to know what is the strain that is causing the pathogen or the particular disease outbreak? And what is the subtype in terms of high pathogen? Then effective management strategies can be easily employed to the disease prevention mechanism here. But the question naturally arises in terms of vaccines. So why don't we just go and uh, provide vaccine to a variety of birds so that we can uh, actually prevent the disease to uh, occur. Uh, the major challenge is sometimes vaccines uh, uh, do not really work. Main reason is uh, they are designed to induce HA in specific antibody response. So virus cannot survive itself inside the body. It needs a host cell. So it recognizes a cell inside the chicken system and make an attachment. So it is a survival mechanism to be able to flourish, prosper, divide, and then slowly spread through litter and also through other means. So hemagglutinin HA and neuraminidase NA glycoproteins, these are basically virus which has a tiny little coating, a basically protein uh, components on the surface of the virus are the targets of the uh, new, newly developed vaccines. So there is also uh, the availability of vaccines is very low. And because of the types, a variety of uh, 16 types of hemagglutinin and also nine subtypes of neuraminidase, 
uh, causes a big challenge. So you multiply 16 by 9, it causes permutation and combination in terms of the division between H and N causes a variety of vaccines to be developed. So uh, by the time, they, sometimes people, scientists joke, by the time they develop a vaccine for a specific strain, a new uh, uh, outbreak happens, that is H7N8 in this case, which uh, happened just two weeks ago in Indiana. So due to this complexity, uh, vaccine is still a challenge and also because of cross-protective, uh, uh, cross-sensitivity related issues. So inactivated avian influenza vaccines are sometimes poorly immunogenic and needs high concentration of the protein. So you need a large amount of protein on the surface of the virus uh, so that the vaccine can go and uh, able to prevent that particular attachment to happen. So the virus doesn't spread, so you can suppress the uh, proliferation of the virus inside the chicken system. So it's really difficult to predict uh, avian influenza virus because it has the potential to cross the species barrier and potentially it can cause a pandemic. So ideally, yes, vaccine would be great because we can't, uh, uh, there is a, prevent the virus to attach to different host cells inside the system. But because of the practicality involved, Vir uh, vaccines may not be ideal and early diagnosis just before the disease outbreak happened might be the appropriate way to go. So World Organization for Animal Health, they have said uh, if uh, one spill happens from the farm to the public, then it can cause a devastating effect. So uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the livestock industries are under enormous pressure to enhance, to improve their biosecurity protocols and animal traceability through a uh, need of novel nanotechnologies. So that's how we come. So what we have done in our lab is we have developed a handheld smartphone appearing device. The device has the ability to detect the virus strains uh, in just about two to three minutes, right uh, uh, then and there in the form itself. So it could be commonly used by the poultry producer himself or herself. For example, if a poultry producer has a flu, and she is suspicious and she is not sure whether what is the reason behind this particular disease, whether it is a human based virus is causing the flu or the virus has uh, come from the poultry and it's causing the flu. To be able to differentiate between the human, like H1N1 versus H5N1, so there is a need to differentiate and discriminate and understand the preclinical screening mechanism uh, using a, a nanotechnology-based uh, smartphone uh, system. On the right-hand side, you see a tiny little mechanism. So what we have done is we have used a semiconductor-based nanomaterial. It is a quantum dot. So if there are two different glycan-based quantum dot, glycan is the protein on the surface of the virus. So that particular protein is mixed with a uh, um, quantum dot in a functionalized manner along with an antibody. So in this particular mechanism, if a blood droplet of blood is being placed on the particular electrode, then both these three components come together. Because of the traveling association, when we shine a light, there is a change in the fluorescent intensity. So the tiny little change in the fluorescent intensity helps to recognize and identify which pathogen is causing that particular uh, disease. So with respect to H5N1 versus H1N1, so it is H5 and H1. So the hemagglutinin differs, the protein composition differs. So the tiny little difference can be easily discriminated and identified and the whole mechanism happens within just two minutes. So what is the beauty of this particular technique? So right now when farmers derive samples from the bird, they derive uh, milliliters of volume. 
So with the developed technology, all you need is just a droplet of blood. It's just like your home-based glucose test. Basically, prick, take a droplet of blood. Within a minute, you know what is your diabetic level. The same concept, but here we can differentiate and discriminate the virus pathogen uh, uh, in a much more sophisticated and easier manner. It's very easy. Because of the nanotechnology involved, the high surface area to volume ratio, the amount of chemicals we are using in this particular method is very, very low. So unlike a lab-based test. So in the laboratory, you would need milliliters, sometimes a macro scale volume of reagents and chemicals to be able to process and initiate the chemical reaction to be able to pinpoint uh, what is causing and what are the subtypes of the particular components involved. So it is user-friendly technique. So the farmer has the ability to understand uh, in a quantified manner as well as in a qualified manner. So if the farmer has to uh, know whether it's a low pathogen versus high pathogen, they can go about quickly screening and differentiating uh, using this device. We also went ahead and used uh, an electrochemical technology rather than a optical technique to explore. Can we do multiplexing in terms of adding multiple uh, varieties of H and N? Basically, all these H and N can be embedded in one particular device. So uh, we would be able to use as a routine screening tool in the farm, no matter what particular strain happens. So with that concept in uh, mind, we built another system here. What you see here, the yellow uh, gold substrate on the screen printed electrode has the ability to initiate a chemical reaction. So again, uh, it's very inexpensive. The idea is to bring down the test to a dollar uh, per test. So the cost decides the adoption from the farmer's perspective. So this is the device um, uh, design you can uh, see. It looks very similar. It also has the ability to transmit the data you collect in real-time fashion uh, through an app to a smartphone or a mobile phone so that the veterinarians, the food safety inspectors, and the uh, watchdog and the other agencies who oversee and supervises the disease pandemic outbreak can also obtain the particular uh, record right away immediately. In addition, it also has added advantages of record keeping and uh, tagging and la labeling which form is going through a pandemic with respect to a specific location and what kind of strategies or measures that need to be made. So, we went ahead and did a variety of predictive technology strategy improvement. So th this is a sensor which was built on a fabric using a accelerometer and an antenna. So it's the size of a dime or a, a, a dollar, very thin. And this particular three-axis accelerometer and thermistor can be actually placed on the surface of the chicken bird. So it is more like a wearable device. So the, because of the thermistor involved, the thermistor would measure the temperature of the skin. And the accelerometer has the ability to monitor the movement and the activity. The tiny little antenna has the ability to transmit the data in a real-time fashion to the uh, a receiving smartphone. So you have the ability to measure the temperature as well as how much active the chicken bird is. In addition, there is a possibility to deploy a camera uh, inside the cage or inside the poultry barn that acquire a live video recording of the chicken bird. So by correlating all these three parameters, we could come up with a way of identifying how healthy the chicken bird is. And uh, uh, we also did a variety of tests here. You can see the temperature drop. So the blue dot is basically represents the activity. And the red line here is the body temperature data. 
So it's infected with CKM Z11. Those are not um, pandemic. Those are very uh, low. So you can see the drop in the temperature and the reduction in the activity level uh, between a healthy chicken and a chicken that's being infected. So this data is indeed useful to be able to predict the disease outbreak even before it occurs. Here is an, another example that demonstrates the difference between the day and the night and also the effect of the uh, ventilation inside the poultry barn, how the airflow fluctuates that changes, the feeding time, the amount of water the bird takes. So all these parameters can be correlated and can be used as a mechanism to predict the disease. So we went ahead and developed a uh, app for an Android-based uh, smartphone system that would immediately relay uh, the real-time data such as what is the temperature and relative humidity, light intensity, carbon dioxide, ammonia concentration, hydrogen sulfide, and so on. So why uh, carbon dioxide and ammonia? So chicken taking oxygen and releases carbon dioxide so the tiny little change in the concentration of the carbon dioxide is an indication uh, in terms of telling what is going on with the metabolic rate of that particular bird. So it's one particular bird. If we have multiple carbon dioxide sensors deployed in a bigger poultry barn, we would be able to determine what, what is the tiny little change that is triggering and causing the uh, disease-causing markers in that particular schematic system. Here is an example of a monitoring system for laminated hen house based on Internet of Things. So it's not one particular parameter. We are going to measure the temperature, humidity, wind velocity inside the poultry barn. In addition, the skin surface of the chicken along with the activity using the accelerometer. Uh, so all these parameters can be correlated by based on deployment. The question naturally arises, do I have to go and tag each and every chicken in a bigger barn uh, or a farm? No, not necessarily. Using intelligent mathematical uh, uh, predictive modeling approach, you would be able to decide how to go about deploying the lowest number of sensors uh, on the surface of the bird to enhance the mechanism towards understanding and collecting the necessitated data to be able to predict the disease. So it's a photograph that shows the deployment of the sensor in a barn and the topology of the transverse hen house uh, sampling points that was decided based on mathematical formula. So again, being precision livestock farming, we are not interested in big changes. We are always interested in small changes. Uh, instead of a clinical, we are interested in subclinical data points because subclinical data points and the tiny little changes help us to actually predict and uh, estimate when it is going to happen and what is the possibility or probability of occurring a disease. This is an, another example of remote monitoring of hen house experiment. So we can design based on integrated wireless sensor network using variety of electronic components. These are very inexpensive to be able to provide a low cost solution to the producers and farmers. So the data we are collecting here is a self-decision estimate value with respect to temperature and the number of data points. And we can estimate the tiny little change in the carbon dioxide from a node or a network of sensor, which zone the particular carbon dioxide is dropping with respect to the density of the chicken bird inside the particular barn. If the density decreases or increases uh, in terms of the population of the chicken bird, then we can correlate that with respect to the change in carbon dioxide concentration to be able to make an estimation in predicting the disease. So along with carbon dioxide gas sensors, that we could 
also deploy E nose or electronic nose. These are basically volatile metabolite uh, sensors. So based on the drooping, based on the manure and the poultry litter, traces of chemical components are being released inside the uh, air of a uh, hen environment. So the tiny little changes of that particular chemical such as uh, aldehyde or alcohol or ketone, those metabolite marker can be easily decided and captured and quantitated using uh, sensor technologies. So they will be able to transmit in a real-time fashion to make a early warning system and a, a judgment. So a hybrid environmental and population density management system. I was reading a news just a week ago, Tim Hortons and Burger King, these are two uh, uh, um, companies, they have decided to uh, go about uh, obtaining eggs from non-caged poultry birds uh, by the year 2020 uh, from United States as well as in Mexico. So because of the awareness towards enhanced animal welfare, there is a need for a free range, but in a protected environment uh, to allow the bird to be able to produce the egg in a naturalized manner. With that context, the system of poultry production may have specific impact in the Canadian uh, uh, sector. So with that context, we went about producing a low-cost technology by incorporating a variety of micro, micro electronic components to be able to enable the users to predict the technology and the disease. So here is an example of the density management system. So you can see a uh, uh, chicken bird, they are uh, trying to gather. In certain locations, they are scattered. Be because it is a video, which is a composition of a number of frames of uh, pictures, we could also determine the activity involved with respect to the feed. So we could also correlate how do they feel right after they have the feed and what is the disease transmission mechanism from one bird to the other bird. Uh, so we can go about making a very precise transmission identification mechanism using a combination of these uh, imaging as well as the volatile metabolite measurement technologies. So these are the screenshots of the uh, uh, components we were able to measure from the smartphone. We could see that uh, temperature, humidity, the composition of carbon dioxide, as well as the density monitoring in a real-time fashion in a smartphone using the integrated electronic components in a, uh, in a man real-time manner. So, the graphical user interface and the adoption of the technology enable uh, a real-time monitoring. The farmer can make a early warning decision system, early warning decision strategies based on the data they, they were able to collect. Here is another example. It is a switch to activate event-driven system for chicken health monitoring. So a uh, MEMS device was developed. MEMS is basically a microelectromechanical system. Uh, the idea behind this is if you watch the little kids who are wearing shoes, uh, the shoes used to glow. The more they jump, the more they glow. So it is made of a material called piezoelectric material based on the motility and based on the movement of the bird, more amount of energy can be stored by the piezoelectric material and that energy stored can be transmitted to the uh, battery of the uh, sensor that is attached to the surface of the chicken bird, uh, just using a simple tape. So there is really no need of external power source. It will collect the activity of the uh, chicken bird, how fast they move, and also using Doppler effect, you can go about measure the blood flow velocity. Again, it is a non-invasive, there is no pricking happening. It just sends a light signal, uh, sound signal from the uh, sensor to the tissue surface. Based on the Doppler, you are able to determine the frequency response 
and using a mathematical calculation, you can actually judge the change in the blood flow inside the chicken bird. So this is, uh, these are photographs that uh, shows the size and the shape of the um, uh, piezoelectric uh, sensor that was developed. Uh, the sensor node can be wrapped around the wings of a chicken bird to be able to determine the measurement of the chicken during a specific duration. So again, with respect to change and the effect and the influence of light and the environmental parameters, uh, what is the behavior with respect to change? So that can be determined as well using this particular sensing mechanism. So blood flow and physical activity data transmitted from the microelectromechanical systems on the piezo-based sensor uh, can provide valuable data including the activity as well as the uh, uh, environmental parameters along with the blood flow condition. So you get the physiological data, you get a biochemical data, you also get the environmental data. So the next step is to how to make sense out of these data to be able to predict the diseases. So disease modeling and also software uh, has to be developed to be able to come up with the approach to be predict with what much accuracy, with what probability the disease can potentially occur. So this is an interesting uh, technology in um, the idea here is can we do something in terms of measuring the sound of the chicken bird? So by collecting the sound of the chicken bird, because when the farmer enters the poultry farm, he hears first, he or she hears first, and then sees, and then smells. So all these, so the ear, the nose, and the visual, or the eyes, all these three can be replaced by sensors uh, which, can, which are developed by nanotechnology, by using all these components, one could easily come up with a way to predict diseases even before the disease occurs. So what you see here on the screen is basically a um, signaled background processed uh, frequency analysis of the amount of noise or the chicken talk measured using the sensors we have obtained. So the time frequency vocalization graph helps to identify uh, how, how do they talk, or whether do ha they have an antagonistic approach or a synergistic approach. We were uh, uh, able to find right after they feed, they were happy. So there is a change in the intensity of the noise they make. But just before they go and approach the feed, there is a, a difference in that particular intensity and the uh, signal to noise ratio also changes. So the tiny little peak, the tiny little changes can be attributed and correlated with the other parameters to be able to make an intelligent decision towards predicting the disease. So the goal is because the uh, how do we go about make an intelligent decision for, as a innovative deduction and advanced diagnostic technologies for farmed animal health management towards smart agriculture and precision livestock farming. So biosensors would allow monitoring of animal health and well-being and can also send text to alert farmers when an infection increases or even before the infection is going to occur. Uh, at a herd level, as well as a decrease in the production that happens. So in an integrated farming system, such as the one cartoon shown here, you have a poultry barn, you have a, a dairy as well as swine farm. So the collective integrated technology can help and aid the disease prevention in a much more intelligible fashion. Being a professor, I also teach a course called Bioinstrumentation Design. It's a popular course. As part of the course, students have an opportunity to experience building uh, uh, plenty of wireless sensor networks, and they also attempt to solve real-time practical problems in the lab. 
So by the end of the twelfth uh, or thirteenth week, they give a trade show presentation during which industries are invited to enhance the uh, outreach and also to enhance the knowledge transfer. So this is a popular course. Uh, there are certain aspects of solving problems related to agriculture, livestock farming and biomedical applications also happen uh, in this particular trade show. Very quickly, Premier Kathleen Wynne, she declared and uh, made a statement during October 13, challenged the Ontario agri-food industry to uh, double the growth and also create about 120,000 jobs by 2020. So the technology we are involved in, the precision livestock farming, has the potential to create approximately 3,700 uh, new highly skilled and technical jobs here in Ontario. It translates, uh, the highly qualified personnel could be working on development of sensors and technology, a portion of the HQP might work in the barn or the uh, poultry farm, and a portion may work in the food processing, data processing, as well as the software development related area. So mobile health technologies and apps will enable the alert and also can serve as a, an efficient biosecurity tool or a system for Canadian livestock sector. So with this, I would like to thank you and uh, thank you for this opportunity to share what we have done in our lab.